Well, um, how they worked the stones already in, in this period in the north um, is a quite difficult question. We have already from um, a, a monk, which is called Theophilus, a description from the 12th century, but we have this painted record from the 13th century in a manuscript, and it shows a, a trilling machine but also we have this depiction, and this is Emperor Maximilian I, and he made the mistake that at the time you had long pointed shoes, and he went too close to a polishing wheel. And, and there is written um, palier uh, rad, which means a polishing wheel. He came too close and his shoe got caught into it, and almost he could have lost his leg, but um, legend has it that the shoe got completely um, pulled off and uh, he went out south, uh, sound and safe, but you see it was immortalized uh, in a, a print at the time. And um, you see how important these grinding mills were that even the emperor would come to look um, for the progress and what was going on. This is Prague. Uh, this is here the St. Fides Cathedral, where I showed you the chapel which was clad with all these beautiful amethyst-like stones. And then you have, of course, the palace where Rudolf II lived, one of the greatest collectors in the history. Um, he was Holy Roman Emperor, but um, he rarely left his residence, Prague, where he built up one of the most important curiosities cabinets or Kunst und Wunderkammers of the time. This is uh, um, a mosaic by the uh, Castrucci, which we will see further, but we start, um, um, as I said before, there was this migration um, of craftsmen from the south to the north, and parts of them were coming from Milan, Rudolf II invited the Miseroni family and he gave, uh, invited them and he provided them with a workshop on the uh, castle hill in Prague and uh, gave them the, the starting materials. Uh, they came from Milan and, and stayed until the 1615s and, and made quite uh, um, a career in that town. And in the exhibition, we have this wonderful piece um, by Ottaviano Miseroni, which is mounted in gold, and is a, it's a very rare jasper that only exists in this one example. We don't have a second one of this type, uh, and there are speculations if it is a Bohemian jasper or, it came, or if it came even from Sicily. Um, also, if you look at this roundel, uh, this oval, which um, shows St. Catherine, uh, he was so proud that he signed it here with O-T-T uh, and then the M for Mr. Ottavio Miseroni. And it uses, in a kind of mosaic technique, in a flat relief, uh, more than a dozen of different heartstones to have this wonderful... Um, colorful effect. The dynasty goes on um, un, until Dionysio uh, Miseroni and he in um, the 1630s carved this piece out of an enormous piece of smoky rock crystal and you see there's a wonderful mask here. Uh, it was maybe intended to have a mount but then it was decided in Vienna that the piece as an object is so wonderful that it uh, can hold up and it does not need one of these precious mounts which sometimes can disturb uh, and can take away the attention of, of the of object is itself. And of course, rock crystal and everything was connected with it um, had a mythological connotation. It was thought to be the frozen tears of the gods, um, and uh, people thought if they would drink out of it, it was an antidote, it would take away poison. 
This is the Misaroni workshop. Um, it is presented in this painting, which is in Prague, uh, even like a stage-like uh, um, structure. You see the curtains go up, and you have these grinding wheels, and you have his whole family. There's very precious jewelry. Um, he is sitting there more like a patrician. Um, and uh, in fact, he was, because his family got nobilized for all what they had done in Prague. And um, he became a member of um, the higher society. But uh, one of his major pieces is this vase, which is cut out of one piece of rock crystal. And look at the lid. The lid doesn't fit, and it is empty. And what was inside of the whole thing is here that five other parts he carved out of the inner block like an onion, piece by piece. And it took um, well over a decade to accomplish it. And then it was mounted with the gold in between to form the six feet high uh, kind of pyramid. And it is one of the great treasures in the Kunsthistorischen Museum. And it, he was so uh, proud of it that you see here his son um, and, and possibly successor, but um, he was not capable. He puts it up on a shelf. It's exactly the same ways. So this was a parade piece that the work workshop had executed, and they were so proud of it. Um, now you think why he's showing these yellow lips. Uh, there are 3,000 years of art in, in one um, ensemble together. Um, this is something the Metropolitan can be very proud of. Uh, of these are, this is a fragment um, of a royal woman's face from the Eknaton period uh, from Egypt. So it's uh, over 3,300 years old. Um, but at that time, yellow jasper was only reserved for royalty. And yellow jasper is so rare that I choose this example um, because in the inventory of Rudolf II, whom you see here, the bust that is this very bust was made by Adrian de Vries, one of the major sculptors of the period and his court sculpture. It was valued at 800 um, golden ducats, which was quite a lot of money. For 400, you could buy a very nice country estate. But um, the emperor had also a bowl. And we don't know how it looked like, because uh, the description is not very clear. But it says it was a bowl made out of yellow jasper. And that was evaluated at 4,000, five times more than the sculpture. And it simply shows you how appreciated and how expensive these stones were in the Renaissance and in the Baroque period, and of course in ancient time, when in a sculpture only the uh, parts of the skin would be made out of this yellow stone and then set into and combined uh, with the rest of the piece. Um, also, we know from Philip II of Spain that he, in his inventory, um, his most expensive painting by Titian was 200 ducats, and he had a, a large um, rock crystal ship table ornament that was evaluated eight, at 800 at the time. So it, it is really, uh, to put that in perspective, very unusual and today largely forgotten that this art of the semi-precious stone, the art of Pieter Dura, was such an expensive and so much appreciated art form in itself.